Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. AJ and I want to do this thing with you, man. We call it halftime, and then because um, we want to jump, we want to jump back in it because there's still some questions I want to just ask you about mm-hmm. about Lynn and just just even doing that time of his passing. But we got this thing we call pass time. We're going to hit you with some quick hitters. Let's do it. And, I, and I'm going to jump the sting off. All right. Um, AJ, you hit him with the first one. Okay. Uh, your three toughest stadiums you played in in college. Ooh. Ooh. Definitely Duke. Duke. Clemson. Oh, Lord. Have mercy. And West Virginia. Mm. Really? West Virginia? West Virginia, like West Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia was the worst one of them all, bro. Wow. We went to West Virginia my freshman year with, with Lynn Byers. Went to West Virginia my freshman year. And I mean, you know, again, I'm going to try to give you all the short version. We drive down because, you know, West Virginia is only a couple of hours from Maryland. Mm-hmm. So we drive there on a the bus. We pull up to the hotel. We get off the bus and we're outside just kind of hanging out, waiting for uh, the administrative system to get the keys, you know, mm-hmm. to the rooms. So while we're hanging around outside, um, the hotel manager comes out and um, he goes up to Lefty. So I'm over there with the guys and I'm, you know, within an earshot of Lefty and I can hear the conversation. Hotel manager tells Lefty in his West Virginia accent, hey, coach, uh, might want to have your boys back in by sundowns. People get a little rowdy around here. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the look that you guys got on your face right now, that's the look that, you know, of shock when I heard it. I was like, for real? Hey, yo, <laughs> did, did y'all hear what he just, he, he, they was like, yeah, we heard him. So we were like, okay, it's like that, you know? Cause again, you know, I'm from the South. Yeah. So, you know, when I hear certain things that, you know, okay. Message received, yeah. right? <laughs> like, okay, it ain't safe around here, like, you know, kind of thing. So we go to the game. We walk out to warm up. As soon as we walk out, we hear what I can only describe as every racial epithet wow. you can possibly think of. Wow. Every name, derogatory name that you can call a black man, that's what they called us. They not whispering. I just gotta ask you this though. They, 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 I gotta oh, ask no, you this. Oh no, 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 no. Were no, there no, no were there no black players on West Virginia at that time? Well, 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 here's where it gets really interesting for you. All right. Now again, give you all the short version. So, yes, and the answer is yes, their team was black. <laughs> Probably two to three white guys on the entire team. The rest wow. of the team was black. And this is what they this is what they this is still what they hit us with. So we like. Wow. Okay. So at the time, um, nobody's in the gym because it's early. So you can hear everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So as the gym starts to get crowded, we're thinking like, okay, eventually, you know, they'll get drowned out. Didn't get drowned out. Got worse. (laughs) More people came in and started saying all the same thing, calling us N words, calling us, you know, all types of everything you can think of. Right. And they're right behind the bench. They're literally right behind the bench. There's no separation from them. They're right behind the bench. So they're right on top of you. So you can clearly hear everybody in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth row. You can hear them. Mm. So the game starts. So now we're like, okay, you know what? We're going to beat the hell out of these dudes right now. Just on this, on y'all talking to us like this. So first half starts. Um, they still raining down in words and, and this, that, and the other. And, then, and we're beating the hell out of them, right? Second half comes. We turn it up, right? So now we're up like 20, okay? Because there ain't no way you're going to call me these names and I'm going to lose to you too, right. right? So we beat the hell out of West Virginia. So with probably eight, nine minutes left in the game, we're up 20. And so lefty is just kind of cruising. So one of my teammates, Derek Lewis, right, uh, <laughs> who's a funny dude, turns around. At this point, it's gotten so bad to where we, we're not even mad because we went in the game. We're just like, what is wrong with these people? So Derek starts messing with the crowd. Derek turns around and asks the, the, the main guy who was just, you know, because there's always one leader that's yeah. you know, more louder than everybody else. 
So Derek turns around to the guy. He said, hey, listen, man, y'all got black players on y'all team. What do y'all say about them if y'all saying this about us? So the guy stops and pauses for like three seconds and doesn't say anything. And everybody in the crowd around him is kind of looking at him like, well, you know, respond to him. He's talking to him. And so we all turn around and we're looking at the dude waiting for a response. And the dude thinks for like three seconds, he pauses. And then he says, when they lose, they're in words too. <laughs> Quote, unquote. <laughs> well, we had the exact same reaction y'all got, right? Damn. They, they, that's exactly what he said. He says, when they lose, they're in words too. Quote, unquote. <laughs> And we we all just like y'all are doing right now. We all our whole world. We bust out laughing. Oh, wow! Man. You know, <laughs> and the people in the stand started laughing. You know, and at that point, and we was like, okay. And 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 the, and the funny part is, after that, they stopped. Mm. They stopped. They stopped. And like we literally like, I didn't think we ended up joking with them. Mm. Like you know, like okay, you know, like they, now that's over with mm. kind of thing. You mm. know. So, and it's like, this is 1985, bro. Damn. <laughs> this is like 1965. Right. 1985, man. So that was the most volatile college environment I had ever played in. That happened to me my freshman year. So that totally, when I went down to Cameron Indoor Stadium, that was, you know, bad and, and loud and all that. But it was, it wasn't, it wasn't West Virginia, bro. Mm, yeah. I was ready yeah. after I had been prepped by West Virginia. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me with this one. This one might be tough for you, man. Give me three people you met over the years that influenced you uh, that had not played basketball. That had not played basketball. Let me think about that. Hmm. That is a tough one because my circle is so much basketball. I tell you what, um, my freshman year, I'm a big Muhammad Ali fan. And I met Muhammad Ali my freshman year in Atlanta. Mm. Uh, we took pictures with him. We stayed at the Army Hotel. I can't remember if we were playing Georgia Tech or if we were, I think we were playing Georgia Tech because we wouldn't have been there for the ACC tournament. The ACC tournament was in North Carolina. So we were playing Georgia Tech. Uh, again, Lynn Bias was the first true quote unquote star I ever met. And then the next star I met was Muhammad Ali. Mm. And um, I had profound respect for him as a boxer. Uh, but I grew to respect the man as I got older. You know, once I got past 18 and started to take some African-American studies classes and and started to get more up on what really happened in the 1960s and, mm -hmm. and started to, to hear the story of why he uh, declined to go to the military. Mm -hmm. um, so as I learned about him after meeting him, I tried to apply some of the ideologies uh, to my life, meaning, um, you know, I always put my family first. Um, I try not to judge people even when they judge me. Mm -hmm. um, and most importantly, knowing who you are mm. and, and, and recognizing that everybody doesn't have your best interests um, in mind. And so, and, and being educated and having knowledge of yourself. Uh, those were things that, that I think uh, studying some of the stuff that Muhammad Ali went through, mm -hmm. uh, because I became more interested after I met him. And, and, and so meeting him and, and reading his quotes and talking about, uh, you know, his travels and, and the struggles he had. And he was, you know, actually dealing with Parkinson at that time. Mm -hmm. um, those were things that that helped me get through and navigate some hard times of my own. Um, and you realize that, you know, people all of all walks of life go through really hard things sometimes. Right. And, um, and knowledge of self and, and, and putting your family and God first is uh, is important, no matter who your God is. Um, and, and that is is those are things that will help you as a man. OK. This is my this is my next one. Toughest player you played against, high school or college, who never made it to the NBA, but you thought they should have. One one person, mm. that one guy. That didn't make it. Wow. 
Damn. that you played against um, high school or college? You know, I, there was a guy in high school from my uh, from my county, probably the best all around athlete in the county. His name was Dwayne Newby. Didn't make it to college. Uh, got caught up in the street life. Mm. But uh, I'll give you a quick bio on the dude. Um, the dude uh, was six foot five. He was two hundred and thirty pounds. He played football and basketball, and ran track. And he was all state in all three. Wow. He was that big, and he ran track. He not only did he run, not only did he run track, AG. He was a sprinter. Damn. He was a. He ran the one hundred and the two hundred, and he ran the ankle leg on the four by one hundred. At six foot five, two hundred and thirty pounds on the football team. He wasn't a tight end. He was a wide out. Damn. Because no, because he was unguardable when they when they pushed him, they put him out, put him they put him out at the wide out position. You, you couldn't jump with him. He had a 40 inch vertical. You couldn't run with him because he he ran a, a, a 10, like a 10-1. He, he was literally all state sprinter. And on the basketball court, he pretty much played every position that was. I never beat him in a jump ball, and I never lost jump balls. But he I couldn't beat him in a jump ball. He out jumped me on the jump ball every single time at six foot five. I was six foot seven. I think the first time at six foot six, the first time I saw him as a sophomore, never beat him in a jump ball. My junior year, um, I was six foot seven, never beat him in a jump ball. He was a year older than me. Couldn't do nothing with that dude. He played on the outside. He played inside. Uh, and, and literally, he was all state, all district, all regional. And uh, like I said, um, you know, he got caught up in some things after college and really just, he was one of those guys, unfortunately, and you guys know guys like this, that they just never seem to be able to to get past where we're from. Mm. You know, guys that can't see life outside of the block, yeah. outside off the block. And so he was a guy, had he been able to go to five-star, there's no telling what would have happened. Wow. Um, if he'd have been able to go to a big time football camp, there's no telling what would have happened. Um, you know, those two sports he legitimately had, I don't think he would have been an all world sprinter. Um, but I, but he was just that much faster than everybody else, you know, on a regional level. But, um, as an athlete, he's to this day, we still talk about him in my hometown and in my district with different guys who I grew up playing against. Uh, Dwayne Newby was, was, probably one of the, probably the best all around athlete we may have ever seen. Wow. Cause we don't know, we can't, none of us in our class or even behind us can name a guy who was all state in three sports. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. And, and we talk about the state of Virginia, right? We ain't talking about a little state. We ain't talking about a, a state that don't produce athletes. Right. We don't even have time to go through the list of football players and basketball players that have come out of Virginia from, you know, Lawrence Taylor, uh, Bruce Smith, Allen Iverson, Michael Vick, you know, that's just on the football side. You know, in basketball side, you got Moses Malone, J.R. Reed, and, you know, there, there are so many, you know, so many guys that I could name. You know, Allen Iverson was the, the only other guy that was all-state basketball and football. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there are tons of guys that I could, that I could name. Yeah. That's a factory down there, man, no doubt. Yeah. It- my next question for you, if it had not been basketball when you turned that into a professional career, what would Tony Massenburg be doing now? Um, you know, I've always had an interest in, in media. Mm. So, you know, I think basketball gave me the platform to get there, mm. but I would have probably been interested in being in the media, even if I uh, were had not had the opportunity to play at a high level Mm. um, because I always love sports, all sports. And I like talking about sports. So I I think uh, I would have pursued that. I actually was a a radio, television, and film major my freshman year. Mm -hmm. But good gracious almighty, I could not do that and practice, you know, three, four hours a day um, at the level that you need to be committed to play at the University of Maryland. It was from an academic standpoint, I, I could not handle that and, you know, play basketball. So I had to change my major after my uh, first first uh, first year, actually, my first semester. I was like, classes were too hard, too long. Like, I, I can't do it. And when you got to the NBA, your three favorite cities you played in, 
for in your career? Three favorite cities I played in. Vancouver is one of them. Vancouver is one of my favorite cities. L.A. was one of my favorite cities. And, um, you know, in L.A., for the obvious reason, I was actually playing for the Clippers in the 90s, so we know there wasn't no winning going on. <laughs> right, so right. I was, it, it wasn't the reason. It wasn't my favorite city because we was because we was killing them on the court. Right, right. <laughs> so, but I was in my, you know, early 20s at that time, so a young man in L.A., you know, um, you know, fun in the sun, you know, that's what that was. Um, the other favorite city, man, you know what? I, I got to be honest, bro. The, the Barcelona was a lot of fun when I got to play for FC Barcelona mm. uh, during, my, during my time in Europe. It was really one of my favorite cities. I mean, I, I truly enjoyed the experience, and the organization was awesome, and, and the city is, is, is amazing. The food, the I can't food even was good. The, the, night, the, the night food life was good. The, area. Yeah, the nightlife was, was unbelievable. Now, nightlife was unbelievable. The food. Um, you guys know everybody that goes to Europe drops weight. Like you automatically lose weight in Europe from just practicing twice a day uh-huh. and eating food that's not uh as saturated with fat and sugar, you know, as our food typically is. And not being able to get certain things that you're accustomed to. Your diet changes a little bit. I literally uh played during my time in Europe, man. I don't think I got above two forty. Wow. And uh wow. But yeah, I think I played at two forty. Uh, right around 240 the whole time that I was in Europe. And the ironic thing about that is, you know, I noticed my bounce went up considerably. I tell people, you know, I hopped probably the best I ever had when I was in Europe. And I couldn't figure out why that was for a while. And then I, I thought about it. I was like, damn, I was jumping better because I was playing at my college weight, you wow. know, at that, at that point. Yeah, because I hadn't been 240 since, like, I was 242 when I graduated college. And I was over in Europe three years later playing at like, you know, between 235 and 240. Mm. So, um, but I was super bouncy. Um, but I didn't feel quite like myself. Mm. Um, and so I didn't like playing. Uh, my, my, you know, body fat was super low. It's always been low, but it was, I think it was, it, that was too light for me. Mm. And I was successful. I was all Europe. You know, I was top five in mm-hmm. Europe. Um, the all Europe team that year was me, uh, Arvita Sabonis. Mm. You know Sabonis, mm. right? He was playing for Real Madrid, so he was my rival. Um, uh, the other guy was Roy Tarkley. Yeah. That was the front line. And the two guards, the two guards were Oscar Smith. Uh, you guys know the great shooter, Oscar Smith. Yeah. Um, and Andre Turner, the little general from the University of Memphis. Okay. You remember him? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that was the all-Europe team. That was the all-Europe team. We were a European Cup team. We played all over Russia and, and all of it. It was a great experience, man. So, um, that team could be, could be some proteins back in the day. Shoot. No, no, yeah, well, that's what I said to people. And, and by the way, that was the toughest guy. One of the toughest guys I had to guard. Arvidas. Arvidas Sabon. We used to go with Arvidas. We used to go at it, bro. We used to go he at it. He was a big man. And he passed that thing, too. Seven, seven, three. Seven foot three, three hundred twenty pounds, shooting three pointers, dropping dimes. When I say like dropping dimes. dimes, dropping dimes like Jokic <laughs> back in the day, and literally, you know, throwing half court behind the back passes. He was throwing passes like that. Um, his back to the basket game. He had a sky hook. He was, he was, man, he was hell over there, bro. I mean, we went at it. We had some great games between Real Madrid wow. and FC Barcelona because they're rivals. Mm. That's crazy. Well, Tony, we yeah. appreciate you, man, doing halftime with us. Hey, Isn't man, it? I appreciate you guys. Hey, I got I got one question to ask you because what's the difference in Vancouver and Toronto? Uh, the difference is is uh, freezing versus rain. <laughs> <laughs> freezing in Toronto versus rain. <laughs> rain Are you serious? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, yeah, the difference is... is, is the difference is, is weather-wise, it's it's like you feel like you're in two different countries, wow. right? Because when you're in Vancouver, you got to deal with the rainy season in the winter time, but the weather really drops below like 30. Mm. You know, it doesn't. You got to drive up to Whistler um, to actually get snow in Vancouver. Like it doesn't really snow like that in Vancouver. It rains, right? But when you're in Toronto, bro, 
you know, five below, <laughs> ten below, <laughs> you know, two feet of snow, three feet of snow. You know, I remember when I played there, man, I had a Rottweiler. And, you know, I used to have to go out and walk him every morning, man. Uh-huh. And, it, you know, I, I remember walking out of my building one day. and It was like literally like four feet of snow. And I was just like, you know what? You you going on out there, bro. You go ahead and have at it. You know, you go ahead and have at it. And uh, he's out there in the snow, man, over top of his head, just running around, having himself a good time. I'm standing in the building doorway like, you know, I cannot believe people actually function in this kind of weather, man. Wow. So, and it was freezing. So, but the cities, city-wise, think of, of Toronto like New York mm-hmm. and think of Vancouver kind of like, not L.A., but like, say, maybe Sacramento. Oh, okay. Because it's a low-key West Coast city. People are kind of laid back. Uh, Toronto is more like that hustle bustle. Mm-hmm. So, gotcha. Gotcha. And the, the fans are great in, in both cities. Fans are great in both cities. I want to jump into Tony's career, but I actually would prefer to talk more about uh, just the land bias situation. Yeah, and the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and the, the book. book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why don't I tell y'all what inspired us to, to write the book? Yes, let's do yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, so let me. Well, tell let me, you let, me let me, let me, let me ask Go you. Ahead. Let me ask Go you ahead. that way people know where we at. There you uh, go. I try to shorten my answers up too, man. I try not to do oh, so long. It's just a lot that? to tell y'all, man. Yeah. I try to give y'all the short version, but I don't like leaving gaps in the story because it don't make sense at that point. Tony, man, first of all, man, we, of course, man, we appreciate you being on the show. And um, Lynn Bias was your teammate, friend, mentor, brother. Idol. Idol. All of these things, man. And I'm sure his passing, the closest thing that AG and I can compare that to in our time was when Ben Wilson passed. You know, it just, it just rocked the community. It rocked the basketball world. It rocked you know, sports as a whole, regardless of the no sport doubt. that you played. Um, can you just walk us through that time and that season and where where has it taken you to at this part in your life as well? Well, first of all, um, I'll, I'll give you guys a quote from Lynn's mom, who we talked to uh, extensively before we wrote this book, mm. uh, because we wanted to give her the opportunity before we even put words on the page we gave her the rough copy on paper and we said listen if there's anything in here that you have an issue with you let us know because we want you to be good with this project because if you're not good we're not doing it that's the type of respect that we had for for lynn's family and his mom in particular his mom gave us a quote in the book and she says that lynn bias her son touched more people in death than he ever could have in life. Mm. And a lot of people um, know that she is a a powerful speaker. She's a public speaker. She's gone on since his death, um, 36, 37 years Mm. now, to uh, be a speaker and a champion for um, against drugs and gun violence. And she spoke of, of, you know, how devastating um, these things are, particularly in the black community. And she references her son. And so this is how she carries on his legacy. Um, And she's inspired millions um, with her ability to speak. She is a gifted speaker. She's not a lady who does public speaking. She's a gifted speaker and she has a powerful voice that will leave you like thinking when she's done you know her voice will resonate with you mm. when you hear her speak particularly when you when she tells the story of what she's been through with losing not just one son but two right. two sons so that passage where she says he could he touched more people in death than he ever could have in life applies to me and so many others and i'll tell you how it applies to me because of Lynn Bias, um, I did not know my freshman year that I would actually end up in the NBA at some point. But because of how Lynn Bias died, um, I was never tempted to do any drugs at Maryland. I never did any drugs at Maryland. Never. Never uh, smoked a joint. Ne- ne- never done cocaine or, or any other type of hard drugs. And I found myself... Um, throughout my career at different points, you know, with parties and stuff where 
those things would be mm-hmm. there. And there would be beautiful women involved. Um, and we all know how a beautiful woman can lead you astray. Um, and particularly when you're young and wealthy. And so for me and so many others, I believe that what happened to Lynn Bias saved a lot of us from ever even trying uh, drug, uh, you know, cocaine. And to me, the lesson learned from that is that when you get to the place in life where you have achieved what it is that you want to achieve and you have made it, it only takes one decision mm. to wipe it all away. You're always one bad decision away from either losing everything that you've worked so hard for, one bad decision away from losing your life, one bad decision away from causing someone else to lose their life. Yeah. One decision can alter everything that you've ever worked for. And just when you think you got it all, you can't make bad decisions because a bad decision can put you in a place where you can't recover. So for me, going through the aftermath of his death and then as a University of Maryland basketball player, being looked at as a drug addict, Mm -hmm. right? Being looked at as a dude who either used drugs, sold drugs, or were in drug culture, mm-hmm. right? As an athlete, and not just an athlete, but a freshman athlete who'd never done drugs. Mm. But I have to wear this stigma now because of how my team may pass. Not just me, but every guy on the basketball team. Not just basketball players, but every athlete at the University of Maryland now. Because if Lynn Bias is doing cocaine, then they're all doing it. And so there is a stigma that comes attached to that. And with the stigma comes a perception. And with the perception comes an attitude. And with an attitude comes the reality of how you treat me and my teammates. Mm. So we had to deal with that for those last three years. Now, I considered transferring after the death of Lynn Bias because I was just that devastated. And some guys did transfer. Um, Guys did leave the program. Uh, we were in a whirlwind, but I made the decision as a high schooler to come to the University of Maryland, not my parents, not my high school coach. I made that decision. So since I made the decision, then I decided that I'm going to stay here and finish this thing out. Not going to run. Because I'm not a quitter. I'm not going to run because if I go to another school, the only thing that's going to happen is I'm going to be that guy. Yeah, yep. from the University of Maryland. Oh, that's the drug. That's the drug dude right there. That did. Yeah, he was with Lynn Bias. You know, no, I wasn't with Lynn Bias in in the room when they were doing cocaine. There were two other people who were in that room. One of them was a freshman, but it wasn't me. I knew nothing about cocaine. I knew nothing about what they were doing. I knew nothing. The team knew nothing about what they were doing. The only people that knew about what was going on in that room were the three people in that room or the four people in that room. Three people. Three people in that room. They knew. Wow. So to wear that stigma, um, I developed a shell, right? Developed the outer shell, you know, an exoskeleton, right? Because you're taking shots, bro, right? People don't look at you with the same respect that they had before because they think you're dirty, Right? Some people even blame you for the death of Lynn Bias because you guys partying so hard up there. Y'all killed one of the best players in, you know, in America, with y'all partying, quote unquote, y'all partying. Well, no, y'all. I was never involved. Never did drugs. Right. So having to wear that for three years, right up until you're drafted and having people question whether or not you're a drug dude and. As you guys talked about earlier, having, uh, you know, being one of two guys in the ACC to average a double-double at a time when the ACC is loaded with first-round draft picks and is, and, is, and is acknowledged as the best conference in the country, right? Best college basketball conference in the country. And I'm averaging 18 and 10. And there are dudes that are first-team ACC that ain't averaging what I'm averaging, mm. Right. 
but they first team ACC in front of me. Scouts coming in, uh, you know, questioning whether or not you're using drugs and your draft status plummeting because people can't get over the fact that you're from the University of Maryland and you had one of the worst tragedies in the history of college basketball happen, you know, while you were there. So when it's time to get drafted, I'm looking at my numbers and I'm looking at the guys that I'm playing against and I'm saying to myself, how's this guy first round pick when I destroyed this dude? He doesn't average what I average. He doesn't rebound the same way. He doesn't defend the same way. And he can't score the same way. Why is he? Why do these pros think this dude's better than me? Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of that had to do with the stigma that was attached to my name and everybody else's name that was there. So you figure that out and then you figure out that you just got to work for it. And you got to show people that I'm not what you say I am. But, you know, that takes time. That takes time, you know. So um, from that standpoint, for all of us University of Maryland athletes, we struggle with our reputations as athletes because of what happened and the way it went down and the way it was portrayed in the media. They didn't care about Lynn Bias the man. They only cared about, they, they didn't care about us. No, they didn't care about us at that point. We were part of the problem, not victims, right? Not 17, 18, 19, you know, year old young men who have just went through one of the worst ordeals you can imagine, you know, in the history of college basketball. People were, you know, some people blamed us. You know, there were some people that recognized the situation for what it truly was, that we didn't have anything to do with it. But they were usually family or people who were close to us that had some idea who we were and could testify to our character. But the outside world, for the most part, you know, we were vilified. So with that being the case, you end up spending your college career and uh, and in Walt Williams' case, in my case, uh, you know, our pro career is proving to people that we're not bad people just because we came from the University of Maryland. And, and so Walt and I decided, um, you know, because we played two years together at the University of Maryland, and we often talked about Len Bias because, like I said, he was a huge fan and wanted to know about Len. And so we sit in Cold Field House, and I tell him stories sometimes about Len. And Walt Williams ended up being the next great All-American basketball player um, behind Len Bias. And so he takes the, he takes the, the, the mantle, uh, the throne as the next All-American and uh, the guy that, you know, really helped turn the program around. Um, and then we write this book, you know, uh, about um, what we did as pros to come back to the University of Maryland play organized pickup games with other pros at the University of Maryland so that our University of Maryland basketball players get an opportunity to play with pros in the area. So now you've got University of Maryland basketball players playing against Nick Anderson, Chris Weber, Jason Williams, White Chocolate Jason Williams. I mean, you name it. We had them all. Rod Strickland. Um, you know, you, you can... There are so many guys and names escape me now, but we would have no less than 10 to 15 NBA guys in a gym four days a week up at the University of Maryland. And that was alongside the guys from the University of Maryland. So what we would do is we would mix the Maryland players in with the pros and we would allow those Maryland players to play against pro competition all summer long. Paul and I did that for 10 years. And uh, they ended up winning a championship in 2001. Mm-hmm. And they credited us for what we did for them during the summertime and schooling them. And not just in playing, but in life. We talked to those kids so that they understood the history of Maryland and so that they didn't make the mistake that Lynn Bias made once they started to taste some success. They listened. Chris Wilcox, Lonnie Baxter, Steve Blake, Juan Dixon. Um, you know, all of these guys, uh, you know, so many guys who were going to play professional basketball from the University of Maryland, they were part of the tutelage that Walt and I gave them during those years. And they still talk about that to this day. We got a lot of these guys quotes in the book that Walt and I wrote um, called Lessons from Lenny. 
It and is. we're very proud of that. And, and, and the fact that it helped change the narrative on the University of Maryland. Um, Lynn Bias Jersey took 28 years to be retired because of the stigma that was attached to his name. 28 years. The greatest un, undisputed greatest basketball player in the history of the University of Maryland took 28 years for his jersey to be retired. And we like to think that the narrative that we gave the university and everybody else about the brother that he was to me and the rest of his teammates and the inspiration that he was to me and all those guys decades behind him is the reason why Len Byers jersey flies in the University of Maryland Hall of Fame. His jersey has just been retired in the state of Maryland. Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame. Last year, I went to his induction into uh, the College Hall of Fame. He has been acknowledged now the way he should have been acknowledged over 30 years ago. Absolutely. And, and now we're very proud of that because the lessons from Lenny are what we passed on to the younger generation in the way of hard work, dedication and, and understanding that you have to be responsible um, when you attain this type of success. Um, Lynn Byers wasn't just a great athlete. He was a hard worker. That's what I got from him. That's what I learned. I knew that, okay, yeah, he's God given athletic ability. But what I didn't know was the work ethic until I got to the university of Maryland and saw it with my own eyes and was a part of it, was in the weight room with him, was at practice with him, was after practice, sorry, was, was at practice with him and understood that um, this guy is special, not because he's a freak talent, but because he's, he, he combines that freak talent with an undying work ethic and a dog mentality that says, I'm not going to stop until I am the best that I can possibly be. And I took that from him. And those are the things that I talk about in this book. And those are the things that I tell young players when I have uh, the opportunity to speak at camps and different engagements that you can be talented, but talent without work, you know, is not going to get you the success that you want. Absolutely. Tony, man, that's so much more. We, we want to ask you, we know your time is short. Uh, you got to come back on the show. Hey, listen, I got a lot more to say, man. Y'all got I some know. more. I'll answer any more questions, man. We do part two, bro. Always a pleasure, man. You dudes are awesome, man. I appreciate y'all, bro. Oh. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. No, I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all but going there again. Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', trying to fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', trying to fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me I'm a Hoop Dreams the Podcast, an Unlearning Network production Written and produced by Arthur A.G., Will Gates Matt Hoffer with audio engineering from Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a seal fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a seal fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. <laughs>